Let's talk about COVID vaccine, blood clots, and the brain. When I was about to get my AstraZeneca vaccine, some information started coming out through the media about the risks of blood clots. And it made me worried, as I'm sure it worries some of you. So I spent a bit, a bit of time researching it, and I'd like to share my knowledge with you. In this video, I'll tell you what you need to know, what you can do, and how brain imaging can help you. There's many different types of COVID vaccines, and this list has the common ones. It's not an exhaustive list, so there's many more. But in the list, you can see in bold the ones that are most commonly used or the ones that have been injected the most. And the point I wanted to make with this slide is that no matter what the vaccine is, it belongs to one of two categories. It's either an mRNA kind of vaccine or it's a viral vector vaccine. They're both designed to stimulate your immune system to produce antibodies that can attach to those red spikes on top of the coronavirus and disable the real virus. The problem with the blood clots occurs only with the viral vector vaccines. And that's quite important to understand because if you had the mRNA vaccine, you're not at risk for these blood clots. The process that happens in the body that, that creates those bl blood clots is called different things. But the most important thing to understand is that, is that it has three components. Component number one is the thrombosis, so the formation of a blood clot, usually in a deep vein, but it can get into an artery as well. There is the thrombocytopenia, which is the low platelet count. And the third thing is the immune response. For some reason, the body starts to produce antibodies to a substance that occurs naturally in our body. The, sub the substance is called platelet factor 4, PF4. It's important to understand these three components because they are the basis for the diagnosis and they're also the basis for the treatment. This is a table with information about the prevalence of the blood clots. Information comes from various resources and you can find these resources at the end of this video. The data was collected at different time points, but generally speaking, the, the literature talks about four per million, prevalence of four per million um, chance of getting blood clots. In Australia, they talk about six per million above the age of 50 and 20 to 40 per million for age below 50. To put it in perspective, in Australia, road fatality is 50 per million, which means you're more likely to die on the road than you are um, to get these blood clots. But for me, as someone who's considering getting this vaccine, this didn't provide me with any comfort because what if I am one of those four people that gets the blood clots? What I needed to know is what exactly it is that I need to look for. And I needed also to know that there is effective treatment for it. So A, I can recognize it if I get it, and B, I know it can be treated and I'm not gonna die. So let's look closer at the side effects that can occur after the vaccine. Generally speaking, the side effects could be divided into earlier side effects and later side effects. The earlier side effects occur one to two days after the injection and they involve soreness, tenderness, pain around the area of the injection, maybe even the whole arm. It might involve being tired, it might involve having fever, temperature, having chills, feel like you're shaking. It might involve muscle or joint soreness, and they might involve a bit of a headache. But these symptoms are not serious and they go away. The symptoms or side effects you should worry about are the ones that occur a little bit later. They are the rare ones, but they are the very serious ones. Typically, they occur four to 30 days after the, in the injection. And in bold are the symptoms that are most common. The first of them being a headache, a severe headache. Abdominal pain, upper, abdo upper abdominal pain um, is quite common as well. And the characteristic of this pain is that it doesn't go with ordinary painkillers. 
So these are the three main symptoms. I want to spend a bit of time talking about the main one, which is the headache, because that's the one that occurs more consistently and that's the one that may cause death. The severe headache is caused by a blood clot in the veins of the brain. It is called cerebral venous thrombosis or cerebral venous sinus thrombosis because it occurs in the venous sinuses of the brain. And this is a simple diagram of these veins. Of note are the superior sagittal sinus and also the transverse sinuses. That's where most of the thrombosis occur. In this image, you can see where the large veins of the brain are located. They're located outside the brain, in fact, outside the tough covering of the brain, the dura and the skull. This is different from blood clots that occur in arteries. And blood clot in arteries are something that we often think about when we think about stroke, because that is the cause of the large majority of strokes. However, when a blood clot occurs in an artery, there is a certain area of the brain, a very specific area of the brain that will be affected. The area that will be affected is the area that is supplied by this artery. And there's three main arteries. There's the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries, here colored in yellow, red, and blue. As I said before, in terms of the blood clots in the veins, you can expect them to occur in the venous sinuses, in the very large veins. And this is a CT image of such blood clots. On the right, you can see a blood clot in the superior sagittal sinus. And in the left, you can see a blood clot in the transverse sinus. It is also possible to take a picture of all the veins in the brain, and that's called venography. And the way to do that is by injecting a contrast to the veins and then taking an image of the brain, a scan of the brain with all the bright veins. This is an example of MRV, MR venography, so venography that was obtained with an MRI machine or an MRI scan. And what I'd like you to see in this scan is just how big the superior sagittal sinus and the transverse sinuses are and to note that this is where the blood clots occur most commonly. Because these blood clots are in veins and not in arteries, their clinical presentation, their symptoms, their side effects are a bit different. And the main one is actually the headache. There might be some motor or sensory deficits or there might be seizures that could happen. They're the three main symptoms associated with blood clots in the veins. Sometimes visual disturbances can happen. Also loss of consciousness, drowsiness, coma can occur. This again happens when the pressure in the skull builds up. If the blood clots stay in the veins long enough, it may lead to a bleed. And if the bleed is large enough, it may lead to death. I mentioned abdominal pain being a common symptom of these blood clots, and this occurs when the blood clot forms inside the veins of the spleen, so it's a splanchnic venous thrombosis, or when it happens in the veins of the liver, and then it's a hepatic venous thrombosis. As I mentioned before, this pain is quite severe and it doesn't settle with ordinary painkillers. And because these organs are quite high in the stomach, it will be an epigastric kind of, or high stomach kind of pain, as, and possibly vomiting as well. Soreness, swelling, and redness in the leg might be associated with a deep vein thrombosis, which is a blood clot inside one of the deep veins of the leg. If the blood clot gets dislodged or part of the, of the blood clot breaks off, it can get into the circulation and get into an artery. And the problem is that it can get to vital organs. So it can get into an artery of the lungs, the pulmonary artery, and cause death of lung tissue. This is called pulmonary embolism. Or it can get into the heart and cause an acute myocardial infarct also known as a heart attack. The last symptom is the tiny blood spots that can occur under the skin. 
As I said before, it's really important to be aware of those symptoms, understand them so you can recognize them and seek medical advice if you suspect you have them. In order to confirm the diagnosis, the doctor will need to run a few tests. And those tests are in accordance with the three characteristics of this condition. One is diagnostic imaging to look for the blood clot. So if it's the head, it will be CT or MRI. If it's the stomach, it might be CT, MRI or ultrasound. If it's the leg, it's usually an ultrasound. Then there'll be a blood test to look for the platelet count. And there'll be a serology test to identify immune response in the form of raised levels of antibodies against the platelet factor 4. As I said before, it's really important to identify this problem early, so then it can be diagnosed early. If it's diagnosed early, it can be treated early, and early treatment is associated with better outcome and complete recovery. As you may have guessed, the treatment is along the lines of those three symptoms. So there'll be medications for dissolving the blood clots. There'll be a platelet transfusion to increase the platelet count. And there will be an intravenous transfusion of immunoglobin to dampen down the immune response. What is my take home message? My take home message is know your side effects and understand them so you can identify them early. If you identify them early, they can be diagnosed early. If they're diagnosed early, they can be treated early. If they're treated early, it will be a complete recovery. So now you don't need to worry as much about the side effects and you certainly don't need to feel helpless. And you can go and get the injection and know what to be careful of. And also remember the more people that I get immunized and the sooner that this occurs, the freer will be to move and travel as we did before. I hope you like this video. Please share it widely so as many people as possible can protect themselves and the people around them. By having the knowledge of what the symptoms are, what to look for and to seek early medical advice. These are the resources I use to produce this video and they're there for you in case you want to go and look further into any of them.